Namaskar, my dear fellow teachers. I am addressing you today, uh, giving you two lectures, part one and part two, on the history of the philosophical and cultural concepts which we have had in our great nation and in our cultural tradition. As you know, our history goes back to a long period. And what we are today is a result of that history. And what we shall be in centuries to come would also be the result of what we make of our past today. So it is very important to understand the past that has been and what possible use we can make of it. Now, who is going to make a use of it? It is our young children who will grow into young men and women, then into a workforce, the able citizens of our country, who will really make our present and hence our future. But then, who makes these children? Who makes the thinking of these children? It is you, the teachers, who do it. And hence, my talk to you about what have been the major cultural and philosophical concepts in our country. Now, how do we get to know what have been these cultural ideas, ideas that have kept this country into a continuity, ideas which are not haphazard, but which are actually a sequential growth. They follow one after the one that has been, and then they give birth to something that comes later. How do we get to know what have been those ideas? Now, as you know, there are texts, texts which are written, texts which have come down to us orally, and then there is painting, there is art, there is sculpture, there is epigraphy, and there is a whole lot of evidence that we have in history through the thousands of years of our history, which talks about of all these ideas and all these cultural notions that govern our lives to this present day. We do get these in history, but how did these concepts come into existence? Is it just because there were different kinds of people who were pouring into India, one after another, over a period of centuries and centuries? Or is it that these ideas were connected and they led to a growth? Now, it is very important to understand that there has been certain very fundamental ideas from the earliest times of our history. And we have certain texts which we can read. The earliest text in India, as you all know, are the four Vedic Samhitas. The Rik Samhita, the Samgan, the Yajuruved, and the Atharva Ved. The bulk of the text is in the Rig Ved, the Rik Samhita. And then when the Rik Samhita was sung in a certain style, then it was called Samgan. When 
the same mantras with the addition of a few more mantras were used in sacrifice, the yajna and ritual in certain movements of which we will get to know very shortly, then that was called the tradition of Yajur Veda. And then there was the later Veda called the Atharva Veda which concerned itself with a large number of other things and which was a later growth. Now these Vedic texts as you know were preserved orally. They were taught to students at an early age. The students then learned how to decipher the meaning and then these students who became Acharyas, Vedacharyas, who knew the Vedas not just by heart but also how, what was the meaning and what was the philosophic idea behind all the mantras, they taught it to their students. It was a very complicated system through which the Vedas were preserved. That itself is a big subject and perhaps cannot be the subject of this talk which is going to concern itself with many other things. Now this text, the Vedic text which was preserved orally and transmitted is the earliest text known in our history. At this point when we say the earliest, then another question arises. Was the Vedic period the earliest? Was there a civilization in India earlier to the Vedas? Was not there something which was called the Saraswati Sindhu culture or the Harappan culture about which there have been so much evidence archaeologically? Let me tell you that in the last 30 to 40 years there has been a big difference of opinion among scholars regarding the age when perhaps the earliest Vedic mantras or what is called Samhitas were collected or rather when the Vedic civilization existed. There has been one opinion largely expressed by scholars from the West which says that there was a race of people who came from somewhere in Central Asia or maybe in Europe. As a matter of fact, there is a big controversy regarding that also as to where did these people come from. They say that there was a civilizational people, don't call it a race but let us say a people who spoke a certain language and they came into India via Iran and Afghanistan and entered into what is called today the Punjab region and settled here and that is when the Vedic age in India began. And uh, some of the western scholars of the old school would put that age somewhere between 1200 BC to 1800 BC. Now this has been challenged by a large number of archaeologists and historians not only of Indian origin but of European as well as American origin and uh, they have suggested that no, the Vedic civilization existed in this country a much longer time before this period of 1500 BC and the Vedic Aryans or so called Vedic Aryans or the people who wrote the Vedic Samhitas and lived that civilization did not come from anywhere outside India that they were indigenous people. So there is this big controversy that is raging and there are 
great and detailed arguments from both sides. Those who say that the Vedic people belong to India, there are eminent uh, archaeologists like Professor B. B. Lal who have written books about it and who have said that they belong to cultures which were entirely indigenous. They have given the dating of as early as 3000 BC or maybe even earlier. In my opinion, the best is to consider the views of both sides and to make your own decision. Because at present, this is a matter under severe investigation. And I think as scholars and as persons who are pursuing truth, the truth of history, we should be open-minded and we should also teach our students about the present state of difference of opinion or the controversy and tell them about both the sides. So, I would say then that the question whether the Vedic people were earlier to the Harappan people or they came after destroyed the Harappan civilization and established their culture in India, this is a matter of controversy. However, I am going to talk today about certain concepts which existed in India and as I said, most of these concepts are available to us through all kinds of science, all kinds of symbols which are available through art, through literature, through various languages of the country. And when we make sense out of those symbols, then we see a large number of those concepts emerging. Now symbol is uh, originally a Greek word and it has come into the English language and it means something like a signifier, a sign which has a meaning. Now there were in Sanskrit words for it. There was the word linga which means sign like the Shiva linga and then there were other words like sanket, which also meant that a sanket is a symbol that indicates. So the history of Indian philosophical concept is to be found in a large number of these symbols or sankets in our literature and in our art. When we talk about the Vedic period, then we are not able to find as yet any archaeological evidence. There are some people who say that the Harappan age or what is found in sites like Mahenjodaro, Rakhi Gadi and various other Harappan sites or Sindhu civilizational sites they were contemporary with the Vedic culture. There are historians who have that belief. So they would say that Harappa and Vedic civilization are contemporary or are perhaps the same. However, if we look at the texts of Vedas and if we see what is contained in them as literature, as part of the mantras or the hymns, then we see a large number of symbols as I was telling you what symbols are. Now some of these symbols are mostly the stars and the heavenly powers or the heavenly sources of natural expression. For instance, there is the sun. There is dawn, there is moon, there is fire, there is vajra and the five elements. And in all large number of the Vedic Samhitas, 
you have a mention of ghrita, milk, honey, corn, light and darkness, horses, chariots, animals and birds. And all these words are used not just literally, but in a highly symbolic manner. Now, let me uh, tell you, what was this Vedic civilization like? What did these people believe in and what were their lives? Their lives were very simple. Their civilization or culture was in some ways simpler than perhaps the modern technological civilizations. Yet, it was not what is sometimes called primitive. It was a very complicated civilization. There is also mention of the fact that the Vedic civilization had some kind of a sea trade, that there were big ships which were going to far off countries, and there was a thriving trade between the people of the Vedic times and other contemporary nations. However, it is also clear that this was what is now called largely an agricultural civilization, because there was no technology as we think of technology now, that is complicated technology which is concentrated on manufacture of a large number of things. That is one aspect, the aspect, the economic aspect of these people. Then what is most important to us is the spiritual life of the Vedic people. The reason why we know mostly about the spiritual life of the Vedic people is very simple. And the reason is that the four Vedas are primarily concerned with performance of yajya and performance of ritual worship to the gods and goddesses. So, the texts being texts of worship, we know mostly about the method of worship, the purpose of worship, and the civilizational concerns of worship or what may be loosely called religion of the Vedic times. As you all know, the Vedic civilization was founded upon the idea of yajya, which into English is translated into sacrifice. Now, in English, sacrifice has many other meanings. But yajna was making a particular kind or many kinds of altars. And in these altars made in sometimes a very complicated geometric patterns, fire was lit and oblations were offered to the gods, the Vedic gods, through the fire. It was believed that the fire is the mouth of the devatas. The devatas do not take partake of the gifts or the oblations that we give to them directly, but they do it through fire. So, fire or agni is the mukha and we, they were offered into the fire as is still the custom in the yajya. This society, being a simple society, had largely the Vedic, the yajya system of worship, in which yajya was the main system. The gods were invited, they were asked to come down from wherever they are, the heavens, they were asked to come, sit take a place near the yajya fire. They were entertained by many kinds of praises, 
which are the mantras or stobha mantras said and sung in their praise and the oblations were offered to them that is food was given to them through fire and then after seeking their blessings and after seeking an assurance that whatever the worshipper was asking the devatas or the gods and the goddesses were asked honorably to return. Now this was the basic pattern of Vedic worship. There were many kinds of Vedic altars as I am showing to you. The kind of altars and the reason for them is a very complicated affair. This is again a shot which you see now from the Vedic Yajna which was done almost 20 years ago at a very large satra or a gathering in Kerala and this is called the Agnihotra Havan, the libation of Agnihotra. The yajyas were very different, very complicated. They were private yajyas by the individual, they were community yajyas and there were royal yajyas in which the state or the king was the conductor of the yajya or the yajman and the community as a whole participated. Some of these yajnas went on for weeks or months or years in a sequence. However, when all these yajnas were concluded, at the end of every yajna, there was a big ritual bath in the river and that was considered to be the conclusion of the yajna ceremony. In the Vedic system are certain fundamental concepts. The concepts that there are powers, devatas, which govern our lives, which are the creative forces, which are the forces that have made this whole cosmos. They are maintaining a world order called Rita, the order of what may be loosely called truth. And this order can be again and again felt by us by offering sacrifice and by offering the idea of keeping a close connection with the devatas. The devatas were invited and as I said entertained and then they were asked to go back. Now this very fundamental process that we invite the special powers to come into our lives, that we come into a closeness with them for a while and then we get back after asking them to depart to our daily lives has been the basic structure of Indian worship and it was followed for hundreds and thousands of years and is followed to this day although the methods of worship, all kinds of ways of worship have changed and developed over the years. That is why many people still call the present day systems of worship as Vedic. So in India, when we use the term Vedic, we do not mean life exactly or religion exactly as it was few thousand years ago in the Vedic age, but as a fundamental truth which we have again and again created through different modes of worship and that is why most of the systems, the philosophic systems and ways of thought are called Vedic in India. This is something important to understand. Now we will come to an area in Indian life of which we have a huge amount of archaeological evidence because we have been able to 
dig up so many archaeological sites and this is what was called the Harappa Mohenjo-daro culture once upon a time and has now been virtually renamed as the Saraswati Sindhu civilization because most of these sites existed on the banks of the Saraswati River. This civilization, it is now believed on solid grounds of archaeological evidence, existed from almost southern Afghanistan to, let us say, the area of Delhi. If more excavations are conducted in Bihar and Bengal, then maybe we will find archaeological evidence to believe that this civilization existed as far as Bengal and maybe down till Andhra. And that would make it the largest ancient civilization ever known to mankind. It seems that it is already that because excavations have been done close to Delhi to this point in Rakhi Gadi. Now we have a large number of symbols which we find primarily out of the seals, something like three to 4,000 seals that have been excavated. We find through these seals many symbols of this period. You see here one of the earliest symbols in the seal and this is swastika. So we have evidence of swastika in the Harappan times. There have been various little toys which have been discovered. As you see, this is a toy cart which was made, but this gives us a pretty good idea of what the cart, a cart pulled by the bulls must have been. Another symbol which we find here is the elephant. This is an amulet that you could wear around your neck. So amulet shows that the elephant was something which we call auspicious or shubha as early as the Harappan times. This is another image of the Harappan woman with a huge headgear which shows that people were very fond of making all kinds of uh, hairdos and very elaborate ones. If you will notice that in this image there are certain marked features other than just the elaborate headgear. There is a very complicated a double necklace, one which just is around the neck and one which hangs down then there is also a waistband which is very prominent. And these are some of the things that you would find in all the images of Indian women and Indian cultural life down to the present times. And also the idea that the woman is the mother. She is the child bearer as is shown by the large hips of this early figure from Harappa and the breast, she is the milk giver or the feeder. Kesha Shingar or hairdos of various kinds exist even to this day in the present times. And similarly, the love of jewelry, the, and jewelry is considered not merely as adornment, it is considered as something auspicious or shubha for a lady. You would find another symbol here, a tree which has two bulls near it. And this again makes an indication that what is imagined in later literature as the tree of life or the kalpataru is present in the Harappan times. I would now present to you the famous Harappan bull, which is drinking water or taking food out of this manja or out of this contraption, which was perhaps meant to serve food 
to the cattle at that time. There may be certain similarities with the Kathiawadi bull of the present times with this bull, but this seems to be the mighty animal which came to be regarded as household affair as well as almost a deity in Harappan culture because it figures again and again. A very interesting thing which you would find now are the letters on the top of the seal which are written here. This is the famous Indus script which to this day has not been deciphered. We have not been able to read conclusively. There have been many, many guesses, hundreds of guesses, but to this day it is not clear as to what was the language. If it was so, then what is so mysterious about Harappan culture would no longer be so and we would know with great precision as to what were certain ideas and concepts by which these people lived and what exactly was the civilization of the times. This is just another example of the Harappan bull and a bit of the script that you find here. Now, out of the Vedic symbols, the closeness of nature, out of just a few one or two or three symbols from the Harappan culture, you will find that certain philosophic notions about the environments have come to be solidified very early in Indian civilization. The primary concept is that man considers himself or that man considers humanity to be a part of nature, that it is not something different from nature. It is not as if human beings were created by God differently and nature or the world was created differently. What was the creation and whosoever made the creation, you know there are investigative verses like the Nasadiya Sukta in Veda regarding that. Whatever was the creation and whosoever was the creator, it was one great unity and the animals and the birds and nature and whatever we find in nature was part of that unity. So you can have a quick look at some of the symbols here which includes this three-headed Harappan animal as you find and at the back something is written in the indecipherable script. I'm going to show you now another scene from this where you would find that there is a standing figure of some sort of either a divinity or some sort of a conductor of ceremony. And then there is perhaps a human being dressed as a bull and then there is a dance which is going on around the whole ceremony. In other words, the element of song, dance, praise, ritual, gestural ritual, which was part of the Vedic times is also found in the Harappan times. This is the famous seal which has been interpreted by many people as representing the yogic posture that this is the seal that represents a yogi in a particular yoga mudra. This is Raj and Hatha Yoga and this is the absolute clear evidence that people in Harappan times were practicing the science of life very early. There are 
some other altars, sacrificial altars discovered later in the Harappan region. And it is on the basis of this that it is often said that these sacrificial pits were the Vedic altars. Some people dispute it, but by and large it is accepted. And the last image that I have here is that of a human figure folding the hands and doing what we call today Namaste. So the idea of folding hands is as old as the Harappan times. Now you must have noticed that through these just a few images, one can decipher that there was a way of thinking in the Harappan times, which was perhaps not contradictory, but complementary to so many ideas of the Vedic thought. Not just the Namaste, which makes the idea that they think of perhaps a single force pervading all humanity, all human beings, perhaps all creation and therefore bowing down to that force when you have an individual in front of you, this idea of bowing down to the ultimate reality in as seen in the individual is an idea which could easily be deciphered to be a Vedic idea which these people, the Harappan people were living. Now, the Harappan civilization is something that comes to an end. It is said that it came to an end around 1900 BC. A large number of scholars agree at least on this. And it is said that there were massive earthquakes, in fact movement in the tectonic plate of the earth which caused all kinds of devastation and the very course of the river Saraswati got changed. It did not flow any longer as it used to from the Himalayas down through Rajasthan and Gujarat into the Gulf of Khambat. No, they said that it changed its course and therefore it dried, so to speak, and new channels of waters emerged and those channels created the Yamuna and the river Yamuna is something which came into existence after Saraswati changed its course or went subterranean. This is an important, perhaps a historical happening of Indian times because any river that disappears and emerges again either subterranean or at another point has been called Saraswati in Indian civilization. So there are for this reason many Saraswatis. Any river that emerges again is given the name of Saraswati. Then of course Saraswati came to signify many things of which we shall talk. Now after the period of Harappan age which went on for a long time we have on the basis of text what may be called the age of the epics. The Vedic texts consist of the four Samhitas, the Aranyakas and the Brahmanas and a large number of ritual texts or what was called the Shraut texts or the Shraut Granthas like the Shraut Sutras, the Bodhayan Shraut Sutra, Katyayan and many others Shraut Sutras. 
there was the tradition of these texts which have come down to us and the contents of the texts we know. We know that this is the time when people believed not only in the worship of a large number of gods known by the name of Indra, known by the name of Saraswati, the dawn, etc., etc., the Vedic gods, but the later gods also appeared. And in the so called age of Ramayana and Mahabharat, we have a period where the Vedic Yajna was performed along with some sort of a worship at shrines. When you see the texts, Ramayana and Mahabharat, and when you read the contents of these texts, you find the emphasis is on a large number of ideas which could be called as post-Vedic. For instance, the two major texts, Ramayana and Mahabharata, they dominate in the importance of elevated human characters. So here you have now in society thinking about almost worshipping what may be called the heroes, what may be called the important women who become the mothers. And we have now the great emerging importance of certain fighting equipment, mainly the bow, the arrow, the chariots. So we know that there is now a, a cavalry and we know that the army has grown in complication, that the cities are larger and new towns were being built by clearing the forests and many sociological and economic changes were taking place. A reflection of the society which had the king, a, an army and a well-governed people. And this is the time when the notion of the king, the Raja develops as somebody who takes directly care of the large section of his people or Praja. He is the one who takes care of a state and governs the state. And this is also the time when the earlier Vedic Varana and the ashram system becomes into a more complicated hierarchy. Now the Varana hierarchy is to be found in the Vedic texts also, but it is clear from the Vedic texts that it was not so complicated or so rigid because there was very little urbanization. In the period of Ramayana and Mahabharat, which perhaps could exist anywhere from 1500 BC to let us say 600 BC, scholars again have different opinions on different dates and you know that the question of dates is a matter of controversy and change all the time. So I am giving you certain rather commonly held dates uh, about the texts of Ramayana and Mahabharata also. You find here now in this very complicated system a social hierarchy and you find an economy which is talking about a more complicated technology than was possibly found earlier. Therefore, you have a larger number of devices of travel. For instance, the chariot acquires an extremely important place. Earlier, the chariot was an instrument of use 
for a limited population, the largely the kings, the royalty. But it seems now that chariot, the bullock cart and the chariot have become instruments of large scale commerce. Now this did exist perhaps in the Harappan times also, but it is more clear to us in the so called epic times. However, the idea that man should live in a close connection with his environment, an idea which was essentially a Vedic idea, was preserved and was made in the service of urban civilizations. So as I was telling you, in this period, we have a continuation of the earlier ideas, mainly that the human soul or the jiva or the atma is very closely connected with the ultimate divine. This is the time by which the philosophy of the Vedic Yajya had also been succeeded but not replaced, remember not replaced by the Vedantic notions of the single Brahma, the Brahma as the creator of the universe, the sustainer of the universe and as somebody who also perhaps brings the universe to an end. In the epic period, this idea becomes stronger, the idea of the circle, that there is creation, then sustenance and then there is destruction. And hence, in the pantheon of the earlier gods like Indra, Pushana, the Vedic gods, uh, Usha and so forth, we have the emergence of Vishnu, of Mahesh and of course of Brahma. You find that it is time now that people have started think that people are beginning to think of making shrines of certain gods and goddesses and you have indications in the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. At the same time the notion of the cosmos is again and again reaffirmed. You find here a seal, it is a detail from a sculpture that the earth is shown. The earth is the one which sustains us and on which we live, but she sustains us by giving us all these trees, flowers and plants and in this you would find that from the navel of the earth which is also a mother, you have the emergence of the world around in which man is located. So one of the fundamental ideas which developed in the Vedic times and which continued through the Upanishads and right into the epic times was that creation is one and man is not the center of creation. Man or human beings are only part of creation. The rest of the creation is as important. There is no hierarchy of creation. Man is not the best of the creation. Of course, man has mind, man has the capacity to think, man has the capacity to know, acquire knowledge and even realize 
that man is part of the ultimate, that man is a spark of the ultimate, different philosophies defining this relationship differently, but man is only, human beings are only a part of that total creation. In the epic age, as I said, when society became more complicated, when it became important to use the animals as part of an economic system, then we had a great emphasis on domestication of elephants, horses and bulls. And you find that very early the elephant becomes a part of the Indian cultural scene. The elephant is seen as the mightiest of the animals, but as somebody who could coexist with man and work. It could be an instrument of war, it could be a beast of burden, it could be part of the economy, commerce, that is kings gifting hundreds of elephants to other kings. So it became almost like a currency itself. And therefore, many sciences developed as to how the elephants were to be domesticated, raised, trained for various purposes. And you find in different kinds of sculptural scenes and in painting scenes the use of elephants for all these purposes. Another animal which acquired immense place, very important, significant place in the Indian social life was the cow. The cow acquired a great place as the milk giver in the Vedic period. In the later period, not only that function continued, but cow became a symbol of the sustainer. It became a symbol of the giver who is only giving and never asking for anything in return. It was considered to be the most selfless animal which men could use as part of the larger system of life. And therefore, there was a closer association of the cow with motherhood. Because the cow came to signify motherhood, love and love of children or what was called vatsalya. So the image of the cow and the calf acquires all kinds of philosophic, social, cultural, and literary meanings right down to the present day in Indian history of literature. This is a seal which shows how the bull was used as a beast of burden, how important it was for economy. You see here bulls resting next to a bull cart. As I mentioned to you, that very early in Harappan times, the idea of the woman as mother and as sustainer of the family gained importance. In fact, it become, became the cornerstone of Indian thought. After showing you the Harappan woman, here is the image of a maid, a chauri bearer, somebody who you know keeps away the flies and the mosquitoes for the king or the rich. And this is from the Sanchi stupa around 2nd century, 3rd century BC. You would find here that she symbolizes through her large full breasts and the big girth and the expansive pelvis, she symbolizes 
the giver of birth and the sustainer of family, the one who raises children or the one who makes the house, then they define the woman as the house itself. Grihani griham uchyati. A house is not walls. A house is not furniture, but the woman is the house. So symbolically, she is the sustainer. And you find this again and again in thousands of images which were carved in sculpture. Along with the animals, even the reptiles considered as close to mankind. They were not considered as enemies. A snake was not therefore a symbol of evil. A snake was not somebody that is intrinsically and forever an enemy of mankind. A snake is not devil incarnate. A snake is again the sustainer of life because it helps Vishnu to sleep and rest as Sheshanag. And therefore, a closeness with snakes, worship of snakes, regarding snakes as forces, whether it is the force of Kundalini for the yogi or it is the force of a deity for a worshipper became very important. And you have from here in Nagarjun Konda, the Sheshanag or the great snake, the Adi Shesha. Now, soon after, in what is called the classical period, philosophical systems became very important. And our systems became complicated and also full of variety. I told you about relationship of man to universe. It was then imagined that everything in the universe is not only to be seen as connected to the universe or as part of the universe, but as something which contains the universe itself. So, the universe is in a particle, just as a particle is in the universe. And there is a saying, yat pinde tat brahmande, whatever is there in a unit, in a pind, is also in the universe. And the reverse of it, yat brahmande tat pinde, whatever is there in the universe is in the single unit. And hence, a single body, the body of a, let us say a dancer or the body of an actor becomes a whole universe in itself. So, the Vedic idea of the Purusha Sukta, where the Purush is defined as the universe and the universe is divided into four parts, the thinking part, the mental part, the spiritual part as the head, then the arms as the active part, the stomach as the one that runs the economy and digests, and the legs that sustain or make it possible for a single universe to stand somewhere, to be located somewhere. You see, we have to see this not in terms of something which is upper and higher and better, but we have to see this in terms of a whole unity, that each is a part that sustains the other. So, the idea of the Brahman, Kshatriya, 
Vaishya and Shudra as represented by the head, the shoulders, the belly and the legs are not to be seen only in terms of a hierarchy, social hierarchy, but they are to be seen as a single unity of the universe where the functioning of each is as important as the other and where the functioning of a given class sustains the other three classes. The idea of the one who bears the body, the body being the anga and the bearer of the body, the atma being the angi is defined as the anga and the angi bhava. Therefore, a single body, let us say of a dancer, has the whole universe and it is through the movement of the body that the dancer is able to portray the whole universe, express the whole universe. This idea was applied in all kinds of Indian arts. This idea is called the Ang Angi Bhava. And this is found, this idea, as I said, not only in the Purush Sukta, but in so many Shastras of theater, of architecture or Shilpa, of painting and so forth. The body therefore becomes a representation of the universe, the creation and a single individual becomes also the body. This is also the idea that leads to the notion of the avatar. That is the supreme, the ultimate becomes a human and leads the life of a human among the humans while remaining supreme. So the supreme is the individual, the supreme is the avatar, the one who has taken birth, who is doing a particular leela or a leading a certain life, performing certain actions and who is at the same time a body, a sharir. So the body and the spirit are entirely united, they are one and the same thing. And this idea is reflected again and again through a large number of arts in India. It is on the basis of this that several philosophical systems develop. And you have the system of Sankhya in which Purush and Prakriti are defined as two primary elements. And these elements are later on also given the name of Shiva and Shakti. So Shiva and Shakti are not higher and lower, but they are a unity and they are mutually dependent. Shiva can do nothing without Shakti. Shiva Shaktiya Yukto Yadi Bhavati. If Shiva is combined with Shakti, then only it can create. Shiva Shaktiya Yukto Yadi Bhavati Shaktaha Prabhavitum. Shiva is able to create only if he has the power of Shakti. So it is Shakti which is the creative force. This again ties up with many images that I have shown to you of the woman. The woman therefore is the creator, the woman therefore is also the image, the incarnation of Shakti. She is not just an image, she is not just an idea, but she is an incarnation, she is an avatarana, she is a actualization of Shakti and she manifests the Shakti through many things her aspects of the ability to give birth and raise family are shown sculpturally by giving prominence to certain parts of her body 
which I have just indicated to you. This is also the time in India when you call it the classical period that notions of Vedanta, Atma and Brahma become clearer and clearer. Although these notions were very well stated in the Upanishadic period and in the Upanishads, but this is the time when Vedanta enters into a large number of our arts. However, at the same time, there was a philosophy which went after the analysis of what is nature or prakriti. If there is purush and prakriti, and if we are going to analyze prakriti, then what is prakriti? And that philosophic system was called Vaisheshika. The Vaisheshik explored the various elements or tattvas at different systems different kinds of tattvas were stated. Sometimes the tattvas other than the primary five tattvas, time was also considered to be a tattva, mind was also considered to be a tattva and many systems developed which went on to define as to what is prakriti or what is a sharir or what is the nature of a human person and the universe as a whole. This is also the period when the notions of yoga, mainly through the writings, sutras of Patanjali came to be solidified. And the notion that the idea that the Brahma is to be known through the practical sadhana of yoga was indicated. As you know that Patanjali defined yoga as ashtanga having eight parts yam niyam asana pratyahar dharana dhyan and samadhi so these are the eight parts which were defined four of them yam niyam asana pranayam they are considered to be the physical aspects of doing your sadhana to reach the ultimate. And then pratyahar, dharana, dhyan and samadhi are the internal parts in which the pursuit of yogic life is not through any external action like yam, niyam, asana and pranayam, but through the inner experience of the rise of the Kundalini. The Kundalini was defined as the Sarpa. It was thought of as a power, as a Shakti, as an energy which manifested itself as a Sarpa or a snake. Sarpa means the one that travels and therefore it travels from the lower parts, the chakras of the body to the higher parts. The sarpa is to be taken not just literally, but in terms of the movement of energy. It is in the classical period that there occurred a very great change in the mode of worship. And as if you can see from what I have been trying to bring your attention to, that is the development of certain notions of how the ultimate is to be seen as living in the limited body, how the idea that the supreme power or the universe or the totality of experience can be seen in a single sharir or in an ang or in a body or in a sharira. Now this is the idea that leads to the notion that the divinity can also be indicated as a sharir, as a body, as something which in itself is divine. So the notion that an idol, that an image made in stone 
cannot be divine is alien to Indian thought. The contradiction between an image on paper or an image in stone and the spiritual divinity, the contradiction that exists in some other philosophical systems of the world, systems outside India, in the Mediterranean and in the Middle East, those contradict that kind of a contradiction does not exist in India. It was resolved very early. The spiritual, the supreme being is also capable of being manifested and seen in a human body, in an avatarana, in a sharir, and that sharir could be the sharir of the body made in stone and installed in a temple and worshipped as divinity itself. Now, when this idea grows largely, then we have the growth of what we may call the temple. The temple, the whole temple itself is a body, a body of divinity, not just the image, the ideal, the vigraha, but the whole temple was also seen as a large body of the universe. And everything which is in the universe is represented in the temple. And the temple had parts, the feet, the knees, the belly, the shoulders, and the head or the shikhar, just as a human body has. So, a very complicated science of making temples and having the divinity in the garbhagriha or the area of light in the temple developed a whole notion a system of art and thought and a culture developed in India around it. So, the great age of temple building begins. It begins first as we see in certain caves. Archaeologically, we have more evidence of that and then it comes into the construction of great temples made in stone on plains outside the caves. You find now that the notion that the temple is a place which is a social gathering, a place for spiritual gathering, a place for economic transactions, a place for maybe even, not maybe, specifically for education and a place for the, where you find that the best of arts, the music, the dance and several other branches of learning are available to the temple goers, this notion develops. Therefore, right from around 2nd century AD, we have these huge temple complexes in India, where all the arts and all the philosophical systems converged to create a place which was not just for worship, which was not just for culture, but was for all kinds of civilizational concerns of Indian society. Now, you find that this was done in great order. It was something quite sophisticated and refined. It was not as haphazard as unfortunately we see in our places of worship today. But it was extremely well ordered and it had a large number of people who would take care 
of different kinds of activities. So, they would be the Purohits who would take care of the divinity, the rituals for the divinity. They would be people who would take care of the sanctity and the cleanliness and the well-being of the temple area all different areas of the temple from the inner garb gray to the outer post gate. There would be people who would take care of the dance and the music which was to be provided in the temple before the deity as part of worship. There would be people who would take care of the scholars who would be living as Asthan Vidwan that is people who belong to the temple and pursued scholarship in various areas, not essentially religious areas, but secular subjects also like uh, how to make perfumes or how to make alloys or how to create uh, the best kind of architecture, etc. So, the temple culture that developed necessitated a convergence, a total convergence of the economy of the Indian system which dominated at that time. Now, this culture largely continues till about the 9th and the 10th century. The kings patronized the temples, but it would be a mistake to think that they patronize the temple and the temple life only, that they alone were responsible. No, the royalty or the upper classes alone were not responsible. Temples were sustained by people. The kings would be taking care of certain temples, the royal temples. But the thousands of the temples that existed in any kingdom in classical India, in any kingdom in ancient India would be sustained by the people, because the people were also the best beneficiary. The king was not the direct beneficiary, because he did not derive any incomes. On the contrary, he gave incomes. It were the people for the benefit of whom these large complexes were constructed. We stop here for part 1. We will go into part 2 and then from there we will take up the many changes in the philosophic systems that take, took place, which were a continuation of the earlier systems, which came to adjust with the new political situation, with the advent of Islam, with the new economy, with the new kinds of governance that we see in the medieval times. And then in part 2, we shall also go to the advent of the Europeans, the British and the new culture and civilization that they brought with themselves and which we absorbed to construct what is today modern India. Thank you so much for your patient listening. Namaste.